Sakatu. A very good day to everyone around the globe. This is your host, Shaisha Sayed. I welcome you to this show, as Brother Misan has said, but I just like to make a, a correction. I am a chairperson MU for Pakistan chapter only. So starting off with today's topic, we all know that no desi recipe can be complete without some garam masala. So to add a taste of our own, a bit of a desi touch to our academic recipes, we have organized and we're bringing to you this very first session of this spicy segment of ours, the garam masala. And let's hope our taste buds can handle all the spices we have in store for everyone. So we are meeting under extraordinary circumstances. Globalization is truly in place. For once, the whole world is under similar threats and circumstances. All of us are facing lockdown, economic crises, and looming shortages. So we may very well be facing a global recession soon together. The West seems to be as scared as the East. The rich are as vulnerable as the poor. Mighty and the weak are alike in their utter desperation. So we see responses around the globe. They are anything but similar. Some countries responded early, like South Korea, New Zealand, and Japan. Some started late, but they responded well, like Germany and Iran. Others failed to realize the intensity of the impact until their morgues began to overflow and the streets became strewn with dead bodies. So the virus has amazed us all. Social scientists and medics alike, they're unable to comprehend its trends. If it attacks older populations more severely, like in Italy and Spain, how has the Japanese nation, whose major percentage of population is elderly, escaped its wrath? If it survives more in the cold weather, we're all wondering how have Russia and Canada fared so well and better than Europe? If it attacks those who are undernourished, how is Africa safe from the virus still yet now? So if social distancing is supposed to be the key to stopping the spread, the situation in subcontinent with its utter lack of such practices is not all that bad. So we will look into the virus and what it is doing across the globe again. But for now, coming to our topic, coronavirus, ulama, and the Pakistan state. Who is in charge? Without doubt, Pakistan is a unique case study. Only nation formulated in the name of Islam. It has the most important geostrategic location, a nuclear power, a population of more than 200 million, 65% of which comprises of youth. Also, it's very interesting to note that Pakistan has more than 50,000 religious institutions, registered and unregistered both that are engaging more than 2 million students across Pakistan. So in Pakistan, religion is defined by the ulma and institutions, and we have some of them with us, or we're going to have some of them with us to understand what sort of a balance or what sort of a model they are following in Pakistan. So most Muslim countries and the religious scholars have urged and complied with governmental rule for mosque closures for the safety of the masses. The writ of the government in Pakistan, however, is seen compromised even within its capital territory, that is Islamabad. Just for the benefit of the viewers, in the end of March, Ulema jointly made a declaration and agreed to close the mosques in compliance with governmental orders of lockdown. Although violations were observed, but they were at the individual level across the country in very small numbers. Some did result in clashes between law enforcing agencies and the masses, there were some arrests that were made, although later things became all right. As the government announced extension in the lockdown on April 14th, that is Tuesday, the same day, Council of Ulama, comprising all major schools of thought in Pakistan, announced their decision to reopen mosques in a regular manner, recontinuing daily prayers, Juma prayers, and the Ravi as before. So this is the situation and this is the current scenario. We have uh, Juma prayers that will be held tomorrow. And in anticipation of what is going to happen, what the scenario is going to be, we are all here together. So our first guest for today who will speak on the issue is Dr. Tau Rahman. He is a PhD in Islamic studies from Malaysia. He's an ex lecturer in International Islamic University, Malaysia. He is a former member of Parliament of Pakistan. And he is also principal and muhtamim at Jamia Islamia Tafimul Quran, Mardan. Also, he is a general secretary of Rabdatul Madaris al Islamia, Pakistan. And he is representing Jamaat Islami over here on behalf of the Jamaat Islami. 
So I welcome Dr. Taur Rahman. And in this scenario, I would love, like him to uh, give some comments of the current situation, what he thinks of the current situation and the declaration made by the ulama. Thank you very much, <coughs> Sister Aisha. And assalamu alaikum to all of you. Uh, <coughs> the situation, coronavirus situation is very much clear and uh, in front of all of us in the whole world, including Pakistan. But uh, responding uh, your uh, comments in the start of your discussion regarding uh, ulama's role in this situation, and particularly you mentioned that in Pakistan, it is a very unique situation here, unique kind of society where the religion is defined by ulama and religious institutions. I will uh, disagree uh, with this statement. Religion and Islam is already defined. Ulama here only play their role to explain to the people what does Islam mean and what is the guidance of Quran and Sunnah. So let me clear here in the very first place that in other countries as well, I, I, I don't think that in other Islamic countries also uh, Islam is defined, the word defined. No, you, you may say explanation to giving some clarity to the Muslims and uh, to give them their expert opinions, uh, interpretation. So in Pakistan, the religious institutions and ulama, they play their role as teacher and as giving the guidance. And you know that majority, I may say overwhelming majority of Pakistani Muslims and people, they refer to these ulama and these institutions for their uh, guidance and they trust them. So in this situation, uh, when this uh, situation arose here in Pakistan and Pakistani government and authorities, they decided that uh, lockdown could be uh, one of the way where we can protect uh, our people. As you know, that these are the most effective ways uh, beside other ways advised by the doctors. So the ulama were contacted, consulted also, I agree. But uh, the ulama says that, okay, lockdown can be made. And the number of the uh, namazis and those who pray in masjid also could be uh, limited and could be confined to certain numbers. But after that, when they decided, so they confined the number of nimazis and those who prayers to five, mem five, five nimazis only and five members only, five prayers, five people who pray. This number of nimazis, it was not uh, consulted and with mutual consultation. One more thing I would like to say, because uh, uh, one may think that uh, Pakistani ulama, they are taking some different path or some different way. Before the government decide, a lot of ulama and uh, very the principles of very big and huge institutions here, by their own choice, they came on social media on different platforms and they guided the people that what should be done. Because uh, Islamic point of view in such situation is that you will trust the medical experts if it is related to the something like this virus, which is a health related uh, issue. So Islam says that in these things, you will follow and you will trust and you will follow the guidelines and instructions of medical doctors. When the medical doctors, Muslims and non-Muslims both, they said, that since there is no cure, no medicine, so protector measures can be taken. In those protector measures, they say, one should wash their hands, clean their hands. So ulama says, okay, you must do it. Already Muslims, when they go for prayers five times a day, so they clean uh, their hands and the uh, evolution process, all of us, we know. And the other thing was social distancing. That was also agreed upon by ulama here that when they say that it can spread 
and the spread could be very much rapid from one person to another person. Social distancing, so, so those, they agreed before they gathered in Karachi on individual capacity, each and every, most of the ulama, they came for this kind of guidance to the people. And then there was a meeting, before this recent meeting, there was a meeting in Karachi, where Ittihad, Tanzimat, Madaris, Pakistan leadership, and the prominent scholars belonging to all different schools of thought, Bareilly and Deobandi and Ahli Hadith and Shia, all of them, they gathered in, the, in Karachi. And they issued, I will say, a very balanced statement, a balanced verdict and guidelines, where they said that since the doctors say that those people who are whose, whose age is more than 50 years and those who are small children, the immunity system is weak compared to the young people, so they could be more vulnerable. So one point of that ulama declaration and statement was that uh, uh, people uh, above 50 years and those who are small children, they should not come to masjid. They should pray in their homes. Then they say that those young people who have some symptoms and some flus and any kind of disease, they also avoid coming masjid and mosque. They should pray in their home. Thirdly, those people who are attending some patients in their homes, they also should remain and stay and pray in their homes. So, and then those people who are coming to mosque, they should uh, observe the, the, the distance, social distancing. Not necessary that they should uh, be very close, stand very close to each other. Even they said that there should be a space between the two stuff and two lines. So all those things were uh, mentioned. Anyway, so many other things, but one more thing, Ulama, in their declaration said that if government of Pakistan, at any point of time, they issue a direction and they decide that the number of Nimazis should be confined to certain numbers and should be limited, so we will follow because Islam says that you must follow your rulers and the head of the states but they say that the responsibility of all those things will be on the government, on the rulers, meaning that if anything happen in the society or whatever, so of course, it is their responsibility. It happened and done. Now the question is that then in this recent uh, meeting in Karachi, is it okay that I'm speaking, uh, taking yes. time, or uh, you want to uh, give the space to someone else? So I would just like to put in a question that uh, okay. we see two, two de uh, decisions from the ulama in a very short period of time. There is one decision yeah, at the end of March in which they say that yeah. okay, it is okay to close the mosques. Then we mm. see another decision in the middle of April and they say no, it is not okay and we need to open the, reopen the mosques. And also yes. um, uh, another question that I would like you to answer is that um, considering the number of mosques in Pakistan, now how are these um, all the decisions that are made, how are they going to be communicated to the masses? What medium is being used to communicate to the masses? And how is it going to be ensured? How are the ulama going to ensure that SOPs that have been defined, they are going to be followed by the masses or by the people who are going to come and pray? That is, that is very important of coming to the last part of your uh, question, how to ensure it and what was the medium used to communicate. Uh, I think there is a disturbance. Farisab is requesting to kindly turn off his mic or mute. Or the admin okay. can also do that. Okay. So. So, 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 coming to the last part of uh, Sister Aisha Sayed, your uh, question. The first thing is, it was uh, not the responsibility, and it is not the responsibility of ulama to ensure the implementation of that decision. This is very misunderstanding here. Ulama can only only uh, communicate to the people 
transfer the message. And as I said, that they had already done it without the government decision, they had done it. And when this uh, end of the March, what you are saying, declaration was issued. So it was through a press conference in Pakistani electronic and print media. It was communicated on social media. It was communicated. And then in every mosque, everywhere, ulama in their own capacity, they communicated the declaration also and further guidance, Islamic guidance is also they provided. My video clip is still you can find under my uh, on my page, Dr. Atau Rahman. A few, I think two weeks, two weeks ago, I had issued that. So communication was done. Now the communication means and sources, it is not with these individuals. These sources, effective sources, media, it is with the government. And uh, uh, give their opinion there. The other thing is now, now might create problem, and it has created problem in Karachi and in certain parts. They believe the government authorities think, and uh, I, I, I am saying I'm sh that this is the wrong thinking. With due apology, that the ulama should not only transfer and communicate; they should practically implement it. Meaning, ulama should stand on the doors of the mosque and stop the people from coming to the mosque. It is impossible for them. It is not their job also. How can you expect such thing from an alim who has no authority? Government authority also present with him, not, not with him. People are coming and he stopped them. No, this is the government job to make some arrangement to stop the people. When the people, certain people came in Karachi, so they arrested ulama there. Why they arrested ulama? What is their fault? Huh? Their fault, if they have some proof, if they say to the people, they don't follow these instructions. This is wrong. We don't believe in such uh, fatwas and such guidances. Okay, then you can say, bring their names to the people and whatever government do, do. Our institution also will play their role to teach and guide that particular alim and particular uh, imam. But if the people are coming, so it is not the fault of ulama. Now coming to this part, there are two so kinds of... I would, like to, I would like to interrupt over here. Kibla Ayaz sir has joined us and I think I would uh, like him to answer a few questions as well. First of all, um, welcome Sir Kibla Ayaz sir. He is the chairman of Islamic uh, Council of Islamic Ideology, Pakistan. And he has been holding this position for the past three years now. And he has been in important academic positions in University of Peshawar in administrative positions. And he has a, a lot of publications to his name. So um, my question to you, sir, Atawar Rahman Sahib is already answering a few questions and you must have heard what he's commenting. We are, I, I, uh, sister, sister Aisha, I beg your apology. If you just give me a, a few seconds just to complete your, your question. One important part of your question was that why two kind of sure. uh, declarations are coming from ulama. So end of the March mentioned. Now you know that the government had decided and declared this lockdown till the 14th of April. And after 14th of April, they, April, they were going to revisit it and the government practically revisited certain things they opened certain sectors on basis of necessity so, uh, gathered together in karachi and they said they give their opinion and their declaration is also public now you might have seen it they said that if the government say that the construction sector is the need of the country must be opened so you know in construction two three people are not working construction is huge in constructions and, and hundreds and thousands of people can join that sector then the uh, food places and the markets which were already excluded have seen it, have observed it that hundreds of people every day are in front of these uh, markets and uh, food places and in front of the banks and this and that so the government was saying that we are going to uh, some realization and open this block down for certain sectors. Ulama gathered to together and they say that if you are doing it based on the necessity, so religious obligations, Salat, Juma, 
connection with masjid this is also the necessity this is also the necessity so if it is the necessity so they demanded that you must revisit it also if you think that that is the necessity the people opened the barber shop they have opened it a few days back uh, shopping malls construction sector different so many other sectors banks where they don't observe the social distancing and people should be with the distance no lines are there in the social media that hundreds of people are standing in the markets so ulama not rejected ulama gave their opinion maintained certain guidances and at the end they say that we demand from the government that based on the necessity if you are opening certain places so please consider masajid and places of worship as well so that was the point thank you very much okay so there are other point of views also coming in some people say that uh, we are probably having a narrow concept of masajid or of prayers or obligations the supermarket cannot come inside the home but our home can be made into a prayer area and there are many other things as well there's a question of leadership there is a question of responsibility if the government is making some decisions of opening up markets and other places the responsibility lies on them but as you said in the beginning of your comment that ulama are in a position of responsibility of guidance to the masses so if they are in that position and they hold that position so whatever guidance they give and whatever outcomes um, are from that guidance the responsibility lies with them this is what a lot of uh, circles are saying so i would like sir kibla ayaz as he has joined us to comment the position of the government or council of islamic ideology on this sister yeah. i'm sorry again because we, we have, i think we have I think, uh, enough time we we are not so much like other tv channels that uh, people are running out of time you again left a question responsibility of ulama if the recent yes, I will, declaration i will come back to yeah. you after a comment from sir kibla if you would like because he has been okay. here for okay. some while and he is also a guest so i just want to have his comment also so that this debate can go further uh okay yeah thank you very much uh, aisha uh there are few questions uh, if we uh treat them in chronological order then we would be able to understand the problem in uh, true context uh, first is the uh, declaration of the old denominations ulama on 25th march uh, which said that if the government restricts number of uh, the prayer attendance uh, uh, according to sharia government can do this and we will not resist the ulama will not resist and uh, the prayer attendance will be juridically considered mazur means that they have genuine reason not to attend the mosque and there will be no sin on them this was the first position and also the council of islamic ideology on 2nd of april almost followed the the same uh, uh, declaration of the ulama but then comes the new situation after the declaration by the prime minister that certain uh, uh, areas and certain sectors have been given uh, the opportunity to function because of this the problem of social distancing was uh, put to question and then the ulama said that if the topmost priority is social distancing then the social distancing should be followed by all uh, stakeholders including the people in the market in the banks and everywhere so if the government is uh, easing the condition of social distancing on other places then of course it will be very difficult for the ulama and for the imams of the mosque to stop people from coming to the mosques there are two things one is the position of the imams and the other is the position of the muslims those who are attending the prayers there was pressure from the attendants of the ramazis the muqtadis as well there was great pressure so this actually made the situation very difficult and then there was another declaration by the ulama 
that was on 14th of april which said uh, there are some demands and some suggestions that government should also allow us to uh, um, uh, to continue offering prayers to continue offering tarawi in the coming ramazan with maintenance of the social distancing like there will be gaps uh, in the saf there will be gaps between the people who are offering the prayers there will be use of uh, sanitizers uh, use of other pre uh, precautionary measures this sort of thing so for this there is going to be a meeting a consultation with the ulama of all pakistan through video link by the president on 18th of this month and we hope that this uh, meeting will take place and uh, 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 there are you know certain suggestions uh, uh, on table so uh, there is this uh, expectation that uh, some joint declaration or uh, some sort of strategy will be evolved uh, as a result of this con consultation which is taking place on 18th april okay thank you very much for this comment uh, we would also like to know uh, this council of islamic ideology our guests and many people around the world are not really familiar how this council functions what is its role or the power that it has or the purpose and ideology of this uh, council could you just elaborate that a bit for the uh, benefit of the audience yeah uh, well council of islamic ideology has a history uh with the creation of pakistan it existed with different names like for the first time it was department of reconstruction uh islamic reconstruction then there was a board of islamic education there was islamic commission there was a council of islamic uh, uh, ideology in the 1973 constitution uh main mandate of the council of islamic ideology is to give advice on uh, islamic issues in line with the teachings of quran and sunna and to help the government in legislation uh, in accordance with the islamic principles uh, it has 20 members uh, seven members from all denominations of islamic uh, masalik and then uh, two judges are former judges are active uh, judges Uh, one uh, top most uh, uh, expert of law one expert of um, international affairs so this is a body of 20 members and one of them is then uh, uh, appointed as chairman the tenure is for 3 years we have a, a very uh, strong research uh, department and the basic work is done by the research department and if there is a legal issue then we have a legal section as well they work together and submit a report to the apex body of the 20 members and after the approval uh, a recommendation uh, is evolved or some sort of recommendations is developed so this is the method of mechanism of the council of islamic ideology okay thank you very much now tomorrow is friday and juma prayers are going to be held across pakistan so what do we foresee how will the government well, react yeah i think that uh, the government will not uh, react with uh, like uh, something like prevention people from the mosque but uh, they will definitely government functionaries will definitely advise the imams of the mosque to try their utmost to have distance between the attendants of the mosque the namazis the muqtadis and uh, second thing is to shorten the friday khutbah and uh, do not uh, go for the pre khutbah uh, long speech and also advise the attendants the namazis the muqtadis to offer the sunnah prayers uh, before the juma fard and after in their homes so the opportunity and the time consumed in the mosque will be very limited uh, uh, tomorrow it is hoped
just hold on folks i think we just got a bit of a technical problem um yes please continue uh dr kipnos please i think we're just trying yeah, to connect these with are the uh, minister now my the, minister, the, uh, the um what are we expecting tomorrow yeah so we're just hoping to we're just trying to connect the line to the uh, religious uh, minister shortly but please continue um as sister was saying so what power does the um cii have um because you have if ulama can do such um can sway so much power what's the role what's the purpose of the cia one may ask well our basic role is uh, advisory uh, we do not have any powers of implementation and uh, there is this role of advising the government and also uh, giving some sort of opinion on certain issues but it has a moral aspect because if uh, a, an opinion or a recommendation is developed by the council of islamic ideology since it has seven uh, very uh, uh, prestigious scholars of different islamic denominations the masalik yeah. that is why it has a moral aspect as well and in many cases the government uh, does extend uh, great respect to the recommendations of the council of islamic ideology and takes the the council on board in issues like for example this uh, corona uh, covid 19 problem and the religious question which are attached with the corona virus uh, crisis i mean just coming from an outs looking from an outs and um, sister aisha's back so i'll hand over to sister aisha no i think you can continue if you want or we could add in our next case also if you could yep. introduce him and add him yep um i've just added the next guest so um would you like to so please carry on please this is okay so our next guest uh, the minister is for religious affairs he's not going to be able to join us right now maybe he might join us after some time if possible because they are having different meetings on this issue right now and uh, the government is being represented by sir kibla yaar sir so i'm going to take a comment from um, over miranjum sir he is already with us and he has joined us from america and i would like to understand how is this issue different in different regions should we take it according to local context or decision of ulama in one place is applicable in, in other places as well because this is not just um, a religious issue this is a medical issue as well So, what would you comment on this? All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Um, it's an honor to be part of this panel and to you know, be speaking in the presence of the, the great ulama. Um, my. Um, so, a few things came to my mind. as i heard two learned presentations one um the first of all uh, pakistan in a sense has this in the context of other muslim countries really amazing situation where the ulama are organized and are capable of uh, voicing their opinion and have the government respond to uh, their concerns um this of course in many other countries that is not the case many other muslim countries whether it's this saudi arabia or uh egypt um and most other countries with the exception of iran we don't really have a case where uh there can be a back and forth negotiation between the ulama uh, and the government and that the government um has such a such an immediate sort of response to the ulama outside of its own ambit so there are of course ulama you may have who are sort of government employees uh but the independence of the ulama and the oppositional ulama if you will uh the ulama who stand completely independently uh yet at the same time they may potentially collab- corroborate and collaborate um with the government i think that's really a positive thing to see uh which you don't have in many other countries um now in the discussion um I heard a couple of very interesting arguments uh which I was not aware of as I I'm reading media reports it seems that as Dr. Atau Rahman 
and also um, uh, Janab Qibla, uh, Dr. Staff, uh, brought to the fore the analogical argument, meaning that the ulama are looking at this analogically. The look, you know, if you're opening up construction and markets, then why not the mosques? Um, and this is not entirely clear that the ulama are thinking rather uh, pragmatically. They're not dogmatic. They're not just saying, well, we're going to do it no matter what you like, but rather, well, if you're going to do this, then this is also reasonable, which I think is a, an important, important point to underscore. But one thing that does come to my mind is a question that I, 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 I may put forth, um, is that is um, Salatul Jama'ah in cases like this, is, really, is it really a necessity given the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when in certain times of difficulty, uh, it was announced from the mosques, pray in your own, um, in your own homes, sallu fi rihalikum or sallu fi buyutikum, as some other countries have done. So I wonder um, if that analogy um, with necessary jobs should be made. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ did not tell people, do not go out under any circumstance, but rather he said, as far as the prayer is concerned, sallu fi rihalikum, because it's difficult, because it's raining outside and so on. So I wonder if that analogy is correct, or, or rather, what is it that I'm missing about it? That, um, so that's just one concern, uh, that perhaps it is not the necessity of the kind that um, people who if they fail to go out and work, they may not have enough to eat. Um, and uh, other people may not have what, it, what they need in order to uh, survive. And therefore, that is a necessity. But, but in the case of Salah, our deen allows uh, great flexibility. Um, and that becomes especially um, a... Um, Especially the case in the case of Ramadan prayers, Taraweeh prayers, for example, where Taraweeh is clearly not an obligation. So I wonder if the ulama may shed some light on it. If um, Kiblaya Saab or Tawrahman Saab would like to answer this question. And just to um, understand the severity of this coronavirus or the impact that it has globally, although we all know the figures and they're coming in everywhere and they're being updated constantly. There have been 2,090,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus across the globe. And we are talking about 134,000 plus deaths. And yes, there have been 515,000 or more recoveries as well. In Pakistan, uh, the numbers or the figures are not that high as yet. But Pakistan does have impact on other countries. And we are talking about the statistics that reveal that in terms of highest percentages of deaths, for a million populations, the hardest, hardest hit countries may be Spain, Italy, France, Belgium, UK, and the USA for now. So with that perspective in mind, I would like the ulama to answer the question that has been put to them. Yeah, uh, are you, yeah, Atawar, Dr. Atawar Eman will speak and then I will follow. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kibla Yassad. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Dr. Anjum Saab. Uh, I don't understand that uh, why uh, in this situation, mostly when I see in, pa in Pakistan scenario here, mostly I may say mostly the mosques, religious ulamas, madaris, tablighi, jamaat, brothers, it seems that they are more targeted it seems that they are more targeted. Because if there are certain violations, for example, uh, social, not, not keeping the social distancing, etc. So I, I myself never heard on the media about some other, some other sectors, other places, from the media, from the government authorities. So this is one question. I don't know why I, I might be wrong. But it's, it, it seems like that. Now, uh, Dr. Anjum uh, uh, raised a few 
questions also and he uh, agreed on certain things also about the uh, role of ulama also and uh, uh, their uh, role in certain in such things sallu fi rihalikum all those things ulama have explained to the people uh, they have the knowledge of these things in different uh, video clips that people may pray in their homes it is uh, not forbidden they can make their homes as masajid they can make uh, uh, jama prayers there all those things being 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 told but again i would say that in the recent meetings ulama again in the whole declaration again repeated those things which are needed for the protection of this virus cleaning social distancing who should go to the mosque who should be at home and uh, sanitizers keeping distance between the two lines you see this is the flexibility of sharia islam that normal instruction is that one should stand closer to each other in mosque in saf saf should also be in order and this should not be so much distance but ulama already said to the people communicated to the people in written form also that there were, should be must be distance between the two saf and lines and the people it's not necessary to stand to each other together but they said necessity brother anjum say that those who are earning people go that is the necessity because if they don't go so how 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 they will earn and what they will eat but my question is that okay certain areas people can consider it but those who are going for shopping for example shopping malls so in other countries those who go what is their observation how they observe how they maintain the protection in all here it is possible also but it has it is it is not been observed in this country so again i will say that the ulama say that the sallu fi rihalikum argument is also there people can pray in their home as well all those things they mentioned but if the government is considering and dr kiblayaz is representing a government institution a government council he also mentioned it because he is in close touch with these ulama that they say that sallu fi rihalikum also we know all these things we know but since you are considering certain sectors based on the necessity so those muslims who want to come on their own choice for getting the spiritual strength also we all know that uh, and this in these cases uh, especially for muslims we believe that uh, Uh, for protective measures all those things in including that we also need some attachment with our with our god also so if keeping and observing the safety measures one can come and pray so with the safety measures can the government consider this was the simple demand those things that you are considering for other sectors if they don't consider and they say okay the situation is like this that we are all in consensus that all other sectors also in other places also we must observe we must keep all these uh, protective measures in place ulama will not disagree again i would say this was a kind of demand you can say like the uh, traders the business community they came and through the press conferences and through the meeting they said this is our demand because we need to earn people want to open certain places this is a simple matter there is no disagreement that one can pray in home or not pray they say one can pray and one can make their own masajid their own homes as masajid but as the dr kiblaya says and as i said before this point i think quite uh, quite quite clear and quite repeatedly said but as dr anjum says there are certain things people cannot avoid like like earning in pakistani society we understand that that our situation economic situation is not that well people will go for earning but still there are certain sectors where instead of 100 people instead of 50 people in one time we can go for that shopping like in the european countries and like in other developed countries people go shopping people can go shopping is not earning something people go to shopping with the money in their in their pockets in their hands they have the money that's why they go to the shopping but how to go and what protective measures they should observe this is the point 
Okay, before I go to uh, Kibla Alsa for answer to this uh, comment as well, I just want to add in that uh, I don't know where you are getting your data from, but as per what I have seen in Pakistan or what uh, reports are coming in through media, the shopping malls per se, they are not open. Yes, the grocery stores, they are open. Medical stores, they are open. And uh, the shopping activity and the overall economic activity, that is really not um, going on as usual. And there are also pockets and places of uh, different uh, sectors or places. You can say in different provinces, the situation may be different. But um, like in Sindh, the lockdown is being observed more. Even in Punjab, in most areas, it is being observed more. Maybe in KPK, it is not being observed to that extent, and maybe in Balochistan as well. But um, the shopping malls are certainly not open. But that is not the point of debate. The point is that, yes, some sectors may be opening, the government may be opening this um, construction sector for one, and there may be other places. But um, to my limited knowledge, and of course, you people must be the experts, I have a little experience of this, but the mosques are one of the places where there is closest contact between human beings, like shoulder to shoulder and foot to foot, and we're all uh, bowing down or we're all laying our foreheads on the same place. So yes, there might be some mosques, a very limited number, where uh, sanitizers can be ensured, let's say, where cleanliness can be ensured, where the masses can be urged and they can be made to have distance between themselves. But we know our masses as well, just like the pressure Kiblaya Saab was talking about, there is a lot of pressure, just as they have pressure of coming inside the mosque, they will have pressures or they will pressurize on uh, standing shoulder to shoulder and foot to foot. And we have not seen people wearing masks inside the mosques and mosques will not be able to give, uh, give out, hand out masks to everybody. And I, I really don't think sanitizers are not even available in hospitals. How are you going to have them available in mosques? So if people fall ill, and we don't even know that um, doctors say, as per what the doctors say, their research tells us that a person may be asymptomatic. That means he may not have any symptoms of the virus and yet be a carrier. So in that case, the construction sector or the essential businesses, they are the responsibility lies on the head of the government. But for the mosques, the ulama are responsible. Well, I just want to understand that if people fall ill, if the virus spreads through this, uh, who is going to take responsibility for that? And how is it going to be ensured that um, all these SOPs are followed? Yeah, is the question is directed to me. Yes, sir, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, so frankly speaking, in Pakistan, it is a very difficult problem. After the declaration of 25th March by the ulama in Karachi, there were many imams of the mosque who decided to act upon the declaration and the orders of the government. And they decided and advised the attendants, the muqtadis, not to come to the mosque. But what happened that in the same village and in the same locality, in the same village, in the same locality, other mosques declared that they will be open and they will offer the prayers and the Juma prayers. So it is a very complex situation in a country like Pakistan. We are not like Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia, there is this, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the system is uh, like, uh, you know, is a kingdom. Pakistan is a democratic system. And then many different provisions, they come in. And then, of course, the pressure groups. So this has made the situation very complex. And uh, there is a need to bring the ulama on board. Without this, it will be very difficult. There is a need for uh, uh, continuous con consultation with the ulama. And uh, like convincing them and then answering their questions. Like, for example, how to address this question that if the social distancing is the most important uh, precautionary measure for uh, controlling the COVID-19, if it is the non-pharmaceutical intervention, then this non-pharmaceutical intervention should not only be limited to the mosques, it should be implemented on other sectors as well, on other walks of life as well, 
it should be implemented on the roads it should be implemented in the offices and in the banks so this has actually made the situation very difficult and uh, frankly speaking everybody is at loss in pakistan how to address these difficult questions so that is why uh, dr anjam is very correct very right because uh, ulama have given this word that in this present situation you are allowed to uh, do the home worship and they have also allowed that although it is uh, makru it is not desirable to make uh, distance between the attendants the namazes but in the present situation it is allowed because it is uh, something like a problem and question of the human life so as far as their cooperation is concerned many of them are very rational and uh, they are open for discussion but then of course uh, the government should give them some meat so they are able to put bone on it okay so i, I gather that since they are open to discussion we can have similar discussion forums in pakistan itself so i would like to move on towards anjum saab and i would like to ask him <laughs> his special specialty his subject is islamic political theory so if he would like to ask any questions related to that from any of our guests anjum saab all right okay so um I mean, if you if you allow me to simply continue um the discussion that's already going on because i think um as i said sorry say it again yes please continue okay so um you know it seems to me that there are two postures or positions possible on the part of the ulama in in pakistan uh, meaning that you could say that look it is the government's responsibility that in fact the ulama are simply negotiating um certain freedoms and certain um protections for their sector uh and their sector being the mosques and 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 religious gatherings um and they because other sectors are demanding um and are obtaining certain uh, rights um so should the religious sector so that's one posture one way of understanding the role of the ulama the other way of understanding the role of the ulama uh, and i think that perhaps the preferred way of understanding the role of the ulama is that ulama are the uh they are the shepherds not only of the people but but in fact of a government employees and government uh, uh, as well kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati um and in a sense all people including government are the sh- uh, are are the herd of the ulama and as such the ulama should could really think of themselves not as competing with other sectors but rather saying look you people are like our children uh you are uh, we convey to you the verdicts of god and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in this case we understand that there are certain necessities certain things that must happen in the society um and therefore you could do that but as far as the 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 worship the rights of god huquq allah um because allah is so merciful and because rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his sunnah has taught us this uh, amazing flexibility we believe that this is um you know for for coming to salah and for coming to ramadan tarawih especially and things like that that we should in fact go a step ahead not merely say that well it's allowed for you not to go to the masjid but in fact encourage you because you are a ra'iya in a sense uh that in fact you should not go right we should be emphatic that look people don't understand how dangerous this could be and and perhaps some people are following and others are not following and we are going to put our full weight uh behind those imams who take social distancing seriously we as the ulama of pakistan are going to 
uh, regardless of what the government says, we are going to say that, in fact, you should not go. So what I'm seeing is whether the ulama can, um, you know, whether, they, in fact, let me ask the question differently. Is there a debate among the ulama of whether they should take one posture, posture one, which is let's compete with the rest of the sectors, or posture B, which is or posture two, which is that let us proactively encourage social distancing as, a, as, if you will, a sunnah of the Prophet in cases like this, and therefore proactively support the imams um, and government agencies who are trying to implement it. So would Qibla Yassab like to answer this, or Dr. Sawri yeah. Bansah would like well, to answer this question? Ideally, answer? Yeah, ideally what Dr. Anjam says is very correct, and this is what uh, should be done. But then we cannot, uh, ulama cannot be blamed for doing something which is very difficult in Pakistani context. If, for example, there are countries in which there is a tradition of obeying the laws of the government. In Pakistan, there is, you know, this trend of rejectionism. And particularly on the religious issues, Pakistani situation is such that, uh, you know, uh, well, ideally speaking, yes, but then as far as uh, the ground realities are concerned, it becomes very difficult for the ulama to say to people that uh, they can go to shops, they can go to banks, they can go everywhere. There, if there is no social distance, is no problem. But then you should not come to the mosque. If, for example, six days a week, they're engaged in activities in which there is no social distance, and on the seventh day on Friday, you are expected to ask people not to come to the mosque for the purpose to uh, ensure social distancing. So this sort of uh, uh, arguments will not be bought by the people. That is why it is a very difficult situation in Pakistan. And uh, uh, indeed, the ulama are in very troubled situation that they are working in. Uh, Sister Aisha, if I may add something. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Anjum well said, I completely entirely agree with him that uh, ulama's role is not only addressing a particular side of some issue. He used the word this posture or this. Uh, so the problem is that since your question was particularly about the prayers in mosques, and about the lockdown and why the uh, ulama now rethinking and uh, demanding like this. So that's why I didn't go in details of those uh, mm, uh, the, the outcomes of the meetings of ulama. It is maybe in the knowledge of, for certainly it is in the knowledge of Dr. Kiblayaz and so many other people who know the Pakistani ulama's uh, meetings and they follow them that uh, ulama said that we also want to say a few things and to, uh, uh, to, to suggest a few things to the government. It is part of that declaration, which is recently also issued, and particularly that before, uh, in the, April, in the mar end of the March, as you mentioned, Sister Aisha. They said that we need to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each and every individual should abide by the rules and laws of Islam, which is for the humanity. For example, not cheating the people. It is in every society, it is uh, uh, forbidden, it is not permissible. Telling uh, lies, cheating. Also, in terms of laws, you asked uh, earlier about the role of Islamic ideological council. And Dr. Kiblayaz mentioned that we recommend certain things to the government. And government gave a, a proper respect to those recommendations. So ulama, they also said that Islamic Ideological Council and other ulama 
they had given their they are now also giving certain recommendations which are regarding the legislation in the country for certain things for example interest and riba now this is not the place to debate that riba is allowed or not allowed and one kind of riba riba is riba and all of us we know but it is in our country what concrete step have been taken to remove and eradicate this uh, war against allah and against the prophet of allah in this country certain other things so ulama in the earlier declaration not only uh, pointed out this issue of protection and uh, protective measurement and social distancing rather they have uh, communicated to the people of pakistan regarding the religious and islamic responsibilities and also to the government that you should also reconsider certain decisions and certain uh, uh, steps which is not allowed in sharia so i will say that if you go back to the uh, declaration of ulama these all things are being addressed but since since your question was particularly about uh, the prayers in mosques so that's why i couldn't go in details but i completely agree with dr anjum that uh, ulama is not like other sectors that mosque is uh, their sector only like other sectors which are uh, related to some profession or some business or whatever no we are uh, we, we we feel that we is our responsibility to guide the people to the true teachings of islam and islam is a complete way of life jazakallah khair okay now we must hand it over to the virus by the way nothing could get or unite the pakistani ulama to this extent as the virus has done so i hope that after it leaves us and inshallah that will be soon hopefully uh, we remain united like this on different other issues as well so one last question before we open the house to everyone all the participants what uh, political philosophy or let's say what um, ideology is being followed from history we see the views of imam ghazali or we see imam ibn taymiyah's philosophy what is the dominant philosophy over here what can we say professor anjum or qibla saab or anybody of any of the guests who would like to comment on this um well dr anjum will be best suited because uh, this uh, philosophy and polemics kalam is not my field well thank you very much i'll speak only because everybody else who is more qualified is silent um it seems to me that in there is a general agreement among the ulama uh of the pre modern era that the rulers the ulama and umara must work together um and the decisions on any question uh assuming that the ulama and the umara are working together uh, there can be of two kinds one is a hukum and the other is uh, a fatwa a fatwa is an interpretation of the religious um uh, religious teachings um that is what the quran and the sunna and the other uh ijma and other things say for example and how they apply to a particular situation the interpretation of that is called a fatwa um and that is the domain primarily of the ulama and then you have what is called hukum which is a judgment uh enforceable judgment and enforceable judgment is the domain of um the the rulers the the, the authorities either those who are uh part of the bureaucracy or technocracy and what not or the qadis that are appointed by the ulama by the government this is of course i'm talking about the pre modern uh, context um and so the same kind of negotiation between uh, the ulama and the umara is something that we can see in uh in the pre modern period as well what is different radically about the modern uh, modern world in most countries certainly is the enormously greater powers available to the modern state 
Um, and the ulama have become marginalized to a very particular, in most countries, again, uh, Pakistan, it's in somewhat of an exception because the government is relatively, plays a smaller role uh, than most other countries. Uh, and the ulama are socially available, if you will, in both pro-government or within the government, as well as an oppositional, uh, uh, oppositional spaces, which is, I think, uh, wonderful for the discussion, dialogue, and openness. Um, so I think that in this case, uh, whether it's Imam Ghazali or Imam um, in my understanding is that they would encourage the same kind of cooperation that we are seeing, um, but perhaps a more active role for the ulama to in fact um, take charge, if you will, of, uh, so what Rasulullah would say, for example, in this case, you know, a man comes from Taif, we have this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, uh, to take bay'ah with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, right, is encouraging bay'ah, come convert to Islam, give bay'ah. And in this case, there has been a war with Muslims, uh, with Ta'if. Uh, this is toward the end of the Prophet's life in Medina. And Rasulullah ﷺ tells him, he is, uh, he is a leper, he's majdum, he has judam. So the Prophet ﷺ says to him, through a messenger, we have accepted your bay'ah from far away, go back to where you came from. Don't meet don't mix with people. So it, it is as if the Prophet Wasallam is actively aware of and actively, if you will, enforcing, quote unquote, right, social justice or so, sort of social distancing. Um, and uh, the same is true in other ahadith, Prophet Wasallam says to, um, uh, to not enter a place where there is a, um, there is a contagion, um, um, there is, and do not uh, leave it uh, if you are already there. So it seems to me that this, of course, Rasulullah was both the imam and uh, as a political leader and a religious leader. But it seems to me that uh, the ulama could, in fact, if I could speak politically, um, this could be an opportunity where the ulama could position themselves as the true shepherds of the country by saying, look, we actively support and actively encourage what um, other sectors don't do, what even government does not do, which is that we, in fact, take charge of the situation and say uh, people should act this way, even if the government is not saying it and not doing it. So it seems to me, uh, you know, the pre-modern Islamic sort of classical Islamic theories of government, uh, our great ulama would would envision a greater, uh, what we may say, pastoral role for the ulama, a greater role for the ulama um, as guides. Wallahu alam. So yes, we are talking about uh, responsibility and leadership. So, uh, like I said, this would be the last question from my side. So, the house is open for questions. If anybody would like to ask some question, they can um, unmute their mic and ask the question. Anyone from amongst our guests has any question to ask our ulama or... Brother Mizan, you would like to ask any question? Yeah, I mean, one of the, the one of the reasons why we um, set up this discussion, um, and as you said in your introduction, why it matters, what's the significance of um, this? Um, one of the biggest challenges is, can Islamic political theory work in the modern world? And uh, we had a great, just a great discussion by, great contribution by uh, Dr. Angela. Now, looking at the postmodern world, uh, and we said about the importance of Pakistan, you know, where Islamic political theory, this is a country that's born in the name of religion. And when we see this continuous uh, schism between the ulama and the government, and then you have a very supportive uh, president or prime minister at the moment, sympathetic to religion, sympathetic to religion. 
it, it, it's quite frustrating, you know, it's quite, um, and, uh, not only quite frustrating, what's going on? How can we resolve this? Now, we just had a presentation by Dr. Kibna Saab, which is fantastic, but it doesn't seem that, you know, um, if the ulama, uh, we've had in the last year or two, you've had, um, you've had the uh, blasphemy uh, riots or something like that, and then you've had calls for, you know, uh, all, all sorts of other things. And, so it doesn't seem that the, in, in the, uh, the ICC doesn't seem to have any teeth. It doesn't seem to go and say, look, okay, guys, we've made a decision. Stop it now. Now let's get on with society. How are we going to go forward? What's, what, you know, why are we continuously seeing this? It seems like the ulama are just a bunch. They're just taking the law into their own hands, doing their own thing. And, and modern Muslims find it very frustrating. Look, we can't get on with our lives. Something very simple. What's going on here? Would would like to um, ask that? Let me just add that even from within Pakistan, for the masses, this is really confusing. We have a situation where uh, the president, in his own presidency, is holding Juma prayers with yeah. five people in the congregation. We have a religious ministry that is asking people to stay at home and not go for the obligatory prayers. And we have different views from different ulmas and practically every masjid or every mosque in the vicinity is autonomous right now. So this is a chaotic situation and we do not want that uh, this should escalate. And we hope that the meetings on Saturday and in the next week and in the coming week, they're going to be fruitful and they're going to be something positive in terms of guidelines for the people because the people are really confused. Men are confused to go or not to go. The hujat was there beforehand, like you said earlier. But now since the mosques are open, uh, the hujat is not there. So what are the people supposed to do? Sure. I mean, so the, the question is, you know, what, the ulama and the national government still need to define. Why are we still asking this question? What is the role? Why do we still have to negotiate who or what is the roles and responsibilities and what are the limits in a postmodern society we've had 70 years of pakistan now why are we still asking the same questions again and again and again and the coronavirus has really uh exposed uh the issue again you know what's going on if, if Baal was to be alive right now and to see what is what is the situation now is this something is this something to be proud of is this something to have we really done it have we really moved on um so if I may say something, uh, Brother Mizan, I'm going to uh, try to respond to this, not because the question was addressed to me, but because something comes to my mind quite urgently. Please. I think that it's important to understand that um, personally, as somebody who studies both political history and, and political theory in the contemporary world, I, um, uh, in an Islamic context, uh, I would I would say that the negotiation and the role where the ulama in Pakistan are somewhat independent of the government is in fact um, a very positive thing. Um, you haven't had, you, you can't have in the real world two authorities uh, that, do not, um, that do not disagree. Whenever you've had a case where the ulama are completely under, if you will, under the, the, the writ of the government, uh, as it is a case in Saudi Arabia, for example, you could see that the jails are filled there with all the people that, are, uh, that have any independent thought, uh, or Egypt, for example, and so on, or in case of Iran, where basically they call the shots and uh, people are leaving religion because they, they see all the failures of the government uh, as the failures of Islam and so on. So I think that this kind of open and somewhat resistive relationship between the two is, in my view, the, uh, the, the right way. It could be done much better. I think that the culture and education uh, on both sides, um, the government, the rulers, and the, uh, the ulama um, can be improved, certainly. But as far as this independence of the ulama, I, in fact, in my theory or in my, in my, in my thinking and in my teaching, I always cite the case of Pakistan as a positive case where you have a measure of freedom to resist because 
you, most people cannot imagine what life is like in Arab countries, for example, where the religion is under the control of um, the government with such severity and with such totality um, that you, ha you, have, you get an extremely um, distorted form of religiosity where uh, the only religious personages that can speak um, on, on national platforms are folks who have no independent spirit, right? And what ends up happening is that most people um, are extremely squeamish in, in, you know, about disagreement with, uh, with the government, but um, secretly in their hearts, they hate it. They do not buy into it. And that's why um, more uh, up, sort of uh, rebellious uh, movements or, or more extreme movements are much, more, much easier to, to um, gain legitimacy. I'm not saying that there are not problems, that such problems don't exist in Pakistan. I think that uh, there are certainly critiques one could make about, make about Pakistan. But one thing that uh, personally I would not recommend based on everything that we know about the political sphere is a permanent agreement about um, anything so that the ulama cannot uh, disagree with the government or that the government does not have a, uh, a place where it can put its foot down. I think that both things are really necessary for free negotiation. In other words, freedom, free negotiation um, requires space for certain cacophony and certain uh, disorderliness. I think in Pakistan, there are other pro enormous problems of corruption. There are problems within the religious ranks, of course, of the kinds of religion, religious discourse that exists and so on and so forth. But I think on this issue, uh, I would say that there is, a, there is something that, that needs to be appreciated below Adam. Thank you for this comment. Now I would like to uh, request our guests for some closing remarks. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, a wonderful discussion and many pertinent questions were raised and uh, we agree that uh, Pakistani situation is very complex and uh, a continuous debate and dialogue is needed to come to a conclusion on very important issues uh, which have national and international impact. So I thank you very much indeed. Atawar Rahman sir, please, your comment. Uh, it was a really good debate, good discussion. Uh, Ulama's role was discussed, and of course, people are looking to their role because uh, they are, uh, you can say, religious students. We we not say religious authorities so much, just students of that field. So I myself happy that a few things which Dr. Saf Kawarsa mentioned, ulama have already mentioned like people say musafaha. This musafaha and handshaking is sunnah. Ulama clearly said that it is sunnah, but if it is harmful to others, then avoiding it is sunnah. Then avoid it. One, man, one uh, example mentioned by Dr. Saf about that, uh, person who came to take oath and make bea. Accordingly, Ulama mentioned a few other examples also, like when Sayyidina Omar was going to Syria and Sham and he knew that there is uh, this epidemic, so he re returned back, he turned back. And when Abu Abedah bin Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala who said that atafirru min qadarillah, are you running break from the taqdeer of Allah? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala who replied, Wazalika min qadrillah. And this uh, returning back is also from the taqdeer of Allah, and this is also the instructions and guidance of my religion. And then Abu Abedah bin Jardin Abdul Rahman bin Awf said that I have a hadith in this regard, and all of us we know that hadith was that if you are in that area, be there, don't come out. And that was a kind of lockdown. Those who are in this kind of situation, so the Prophet said, they don't come out from that area and those who are outside, they must not enter there. So that was a kind of lockdown. 
Now, uh, I would say that uh, a message to myself and to all of you to share that we must turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is our creator and all these things we believe that from Allah Almighty. We by our own protective measures and asbab and all those things, only by these things we cannot avoid such things unless and until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So we must turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, I would like to mention with you uh, a little bit the work of Al Khidmat Foundation. And this is just an example that we should not all, all, only teach people, we should come forward and practically help those people who are in uh, difficulty and who are in need. So, Al Khidmat Foundation, which is a relief uh, uh, side of uh, Jamaat Islami Pakistan, which I am representing here, they until now, I took back uh, until yesterday report in terms of Russian pigs and food providing, face masks and gloves, hand sanitizers, uh, sanitizers and soaps and such and such thing. And, uh, and, and especially the sprays and cleaning of not only mosques, temples and synagogues and different hospitals. Then the, the kits, protective kits provided by Al Khidmat Foundation to different hospitals. ICO wards had been uh, established in 10, 10 different Al Khidmat hospitals. And the whole amount till yesterday in Pakistani rupees is uh, near to 70 million rupees till now. It reach and it will cross 1 billion and more than that. And the beneficiaries until now from all these relief activities are 4,400,000 4, people. 4,400,000 4, people benefited from these activities. So this is also, you can say, one of our requests or message to those people who are well off, not only teach, come forward and help those who are in need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. All participants have been uh, very, very, um, we're very honored that they have come in the first place. This is a difficult situation and this was a difficult discussion. But uh, we are happy that this has been conducted very well and it has gone well. So, yes, Pakistan is a very special case. We have seen philanthropic activities like in no other region in the whole world, probably. And uh, yet is more to come. Pakistan is a land of volunteers and uh, philanthropists and social workers. And they're all um, joining hands with the government and coming to the aid of uh, people. And uh, in the end, I'd just like to say that the God of faith is also the God of reason. And uh, I hope that sense prevails and uh, better outcomes of uh, whatever discussions are in, uh, expected uh, do come and uh, everybody stays safe. So with that, I would like to end this session. Thank you very much because we are talking about 200 million lives that are at stake here. So I'm sure we are all responsible people and the ulama who are the leaders of, uh, just like uh, Brother Anjum said, shepherds of the nation, they realize that there are 200 million followers behind them. And not only in Pakistan, the ulama have a lot of impact and we are going to discuss it in some other session that uh, in the region, the ulama have a lot of impact and globally also. So hoping for the best and praying for the best. We're going to end this session. Thank you very much for all those who could join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.